Now, we are, as you know, journeying through a series entitled 10, and this happens to be the last of those 10-week series. And I began this by telling you about the idea of rule breakers and how we began by asking, why is it that certain rule breakers, the likes of Douglas MacArthur, Stephen Jobs, and, and uh, uh, Albert Einstein, and Pablo Picasso are so successful? and yet are rule breakers, and here we are, we're Christians, and we're keeping the rules, and yet it's not working for us. And I explained the reason why is because there's two things these people know. They know the rules so well that they know that certain rules have to be thrown away and broken because they're not supposed to be rules anyway. They're passe, they're old, they shouldn't be rules anymore. And they know the rules so well that there are certain rules Regardless of whether you want to be creative or not, or you want to break them, you just can't. Because if you break them, they will be to your demise. I pointed out that there is no other greater rule breaker than them all than Jesus himself. The Pharisees hated him because he kept breaking the rules. And then he said the point of doing all of this was, he, his point was, do not think that I've come to abolish the law or the prophets. I've actually come to fulfill them. There are certain rules that cannot be broken, and, and one of those sets of rules are the Ten Commandments. And today, we're ending the series with the Tenth Commandment. The Tenth Commandment reads in Exodus chapter 20, verse 17, You shall not covet your neighbor's house. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife, or his male servant, or his female servant, or his ox, or his donkey, or anything that is your neighbor's. This is the final one. In other words, if you think about the gamut of rules that God could have set in place, he chose to end it with this one. For that reason, it's very important for us to ask why and understand the significance and importance of this rule or this law because he caps the entire thing with this one. I want to draw your attention to the word kavet. The Hebrew word for the word kavet is the word shamad, which essentially means illegitimate desire or in essence, lust. Something you shouldn't have, but you want. And twice this word is mentioned in this one verse, this chamad, this, this intense, illegal desire for something that's not yours. And then finally, but I want to clarify that more than the chamad, what exemplifies this from just lust and envy is the idea of your neighbors. The word rea rea, okay? This is a Hebrew word. That means a close associate. This is actually, could very well be your spouse. Could very well be your, your brother. Could very well be your office mate. Could very well be your best friend. It's not just envy as in you saw some uh, 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 Brad Pitt go to the Maldives and you got envious. It's not that kind of envy. This is a kind of envy that involves a neighbor, a rea rea. In other words, a guy whom you know. It can happen to you as a husband and you're envious or jealous or covetous over your, your wife's uh, whatever, my wife's uh, great family reunion. I wish my family had the same thing. It could happen to you and to me. The question lies then, how do I know and navigate do not covet? And yet at the same breath, God says, aspire, believe me, trust me for great things. But if I saw somebody's house and I wanted the same house, is that coveting? If I saw somebody's car and I said, I want, to, I want to believe God for the same kind of car, I want to believe God for the same kind of family, same kind of children, I have an aspiration to believe God for great things. Now, does that necessarily mean I'm coveting? Which brings me to an old session I've had with you in the past where I talk to you about these lines of your heart. And I reference the idea of pride. And I said pride is a line in our heart that we keep crossing. And many times we think that the opposite end of pride is humility, when the reality is pride and humility are not of opposite ends. The opposite end of pride is actually not humility. Humility is actually the center, and the opposite end is insecurity. I'm, I'm trying to review this for you so you can understand covetousness. We think that pride is the, 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 the pride is on one end, and then humility is over. No, humility is here. Over here is insecurity. In between humility, you've got these lines of your heart, the lines of confidence and the lines of security. These are lines that no one will know except you. It's inside your heart. No one can tell this but you and God. 
And what distinguishes this is God at the center of it. And when you are within the lanes of the confidence in God and the security in God, you are in the presence of humility. The lines. Nobody knows that, where those lines are for you. Whenever you cross that line, which you will, I will, the point is not that you won't, that you have rules that you won't. The point is to know where the line is so that when you cross it and you step on that line, you back off and stay in the zone. When you pass that line of confidence, it becomes self-confidence. When you pass that line of security, it becomes insecurity. The common denominator is you. It's about you. The single denominator about humility is my confidence and my security is God. Lines. Lines in our hearts. It's the same way with covetousness. The point is, where are the lines? And that's the heart of my message for you this morning. How do I know that I'm not just aspiring for something great that God has intended for me, and I'm actually coveting someone else's property, things, donkeys, wife, etc.? I want to reference for you a story, an old familiar story, that is depicted in stained glass windows all over the world. Cathedrals have it everywhere. Museums, the prodigal son. The story, however, I'm going to go down to the tip end of the story where the prodigal son had come home and his father had thrown this massive elaborate party, took the best of the household to give it to him, and his brother was coming home from the field. Everybody was listening to all the, the, the noise and the rock and roll music of the band playing for the celebration of his brother. And we take it off from there in verse Luke chapter 15, verse 25. Now his older brother was in the field. There was a party going on because his brother had come home. He had been in the field working his tail off. He's coming home, and as he was nearing the house, he hears the music. And as he came and drew near the house, he heard the music and the dancing and called one of the servants and asked what these things meant. Basically, he was saying, why is there a party? What's going on? And the servant responds, and he said, your brother has come, and your father has killed the fattened calf. But actually, he did more than that. He took the best robe in the house and gave it to him. He restored the signet ring back to him. His inheritance was returned. He put shoes on him. And he says, your brother has come, and your father has killed the fattened calf because he received him back safe and sound. But he was very angry and refused to go in. This is one of the lines when you know you're coveting. The line when you're angry and you refuse to go in because you are complaining about somebody else's blessing. When you find yourself, and by the way, I, 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 I'm not just saying this to you, I'm saying this to me. You know this, we are all in the same place. I'm not any better than you are. These are the lines. How do you know you're coveting? When you start complaining. When you hear yourself complaining about the things that other people have, the things that you don't have, and sometimes when you complain quietly in your heart to God, which we're all guilty of at some point. That's the line. Let me give you a few examples of complaining. Okay? I've been a more loving spouse than my husband, but somehow he's more blessed, he drives the car, he gets the promotion, he gets out to eat lunches in special hotels. Okay. A little giggle from those who feel that that was them. Here's another complaint. I've been the better brother, but for some reason my brother gets the lion's share. This is the case of this brother. Well, actually, this is, he was wrong because the Bible says that he got half of his inheritance already. But these are complaints. These are, if you hear these, you've stepped on the line. Okay? Number three, I work as hard, if not harder, than my office mate, and he got the promotion. It's more than just envy. This is the guy that's near you. This is the guy that you have coffee with, that you smile with, that you drink with, that you eat with. But behind the back, you have this covetousness in your heart. Nobody sees that, folks. God does. Nobody knows where that line is but you. And it feels like you just stepped on it. It's kind of like stepping on your dog's poop. Okay, You know you did. Hello. 
Okay? I'm more disciplined than this guy, but why is he healthier? Why is he fitter? Why is he, why is he seemingly doing better than I am? Covetousness. This is a sign. Okay? I'm, I'm helping you here. Okay? This could be me. I've been a Christian longer. Why is he more blessed than me? Or this could be me. I've, I've been a pastor. I've been serving for the longest time. The depths of my covetousness probably came out when I've been serving in this church as a volunteer pastor for many, many years, and I had a business reversal. Lost just about everything. Woke up into huge debt. It was my son, my son that you just saw a while ago. It was his birthday. I don't remember his age. He was younger. And I was used to buying them Legos and G.I. Joes and expensive toys. And for some reason, this year, there was just not enough money to buy them anything. And I remember the old, for those of you who still were alive during this time, before there was Glorietta, there was Quad. Okay? <laughs> some of you were saying, What? <laughs> Yeah, there was quad. And I remember in pain and covetousness, I was walking around quad, looking at all the stores and finding my son desperately looking for a toy. And wondering, would I ever find a toy to give this child when they're so used to big boxes? And what do I do? I was going up and down the escalator, and I was very covetous. I was looking, look, God, I'm, I'm, I, I've served better than that guy. And look at him. He's shopping. I've served, uh, covetousness. When you start complaining, and I kid you not when I tell you, God answered my prayer. He said, Joey, I can supply for you. Stop coveting. I went up to the very top floor of the quad, and I've, I'm, I'm not exaggerating when I tell you this. The entire place was dark except for one place that had light on it. It was called Bio Research. It was a pet shop. Everything else was closed except for this place. I walk in there and I had very little money in my pocket, enough for just to get me back home. And in the door, right in front of the door, there was, a, there was an aquarium that said, Hamster, 65 pesos. And I looked at my money and said, that's all I can afford. And I remember in self-pity and complaining, God, what's happened to me? I've been serving you. I've loved you. I've given tithes after tithes after tithes for years. And this is what I have to show for? And I bought this hamster. I was so poor. They said, do you want a cage? I can't afford a cage. It came in a paper bag. <laughs> now I'm not just self-pitying. I'm ready to die. And I'm walking out of the mall in covetousness and looking, and what about my friend? What about that? What about, what about, what about? You know this when you start complaining, even when God's already blessed you. I get home, and I'm, here's my, my gift. And my kids fall, their birthdays fall after one of the other. So one gift has to work, and the rest will work. And I remember I just, I, I said, Joe, happy birthday. And I, I gave this bag to Joe. And if all of a sudden he held it, shh, 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 shh. What is this? Shh, shh. And he grabs this thing and he opens it up and says, what? This is the greatest gift in the world. And two of my sons said, we want the same thing. You see, God is so powerful, but we're so covetous. And so he's telling these Israelites, guys, when you get out of Egypt, you're going to see a lot of stuff. And some of your guys are going to get blessed and some won't. Don't covet it. Don't lust after it. It's not for you. It's for him. I've got blessings for you that will shock you. What ensued after that was a relationship with a hamster that God used for my life for years taught me vital lessons that he wanted to teach me and not someone else. We lose it when we covet others. His father came out and entreated him. But he answered his father, Look, these many years I've served you. I never disobeyed your command. You never gave me a young goat that I may celebrate with my friends. I want to unpack this verse a little bit. He said, I served you. He's not just complaining now. He said, I've served you. 
and I've never disobeyed you. It was a slight hint that you know that brother that you're celebrating for, he never obeyed you. It's not when you complain. It's when you now start comparing yourself that that covetousness gets deeper in your heart. And that line, you're crossing that line big time now. You're comparing yourself to your brother. He says, you never gave me a young goat. Eh, wrong answer. That wasn't the truth. The truth is the, the father gave him half of the inheritance. And now he's never even happy anymore. That's why God doesn't want you to covet. It's because when you covet, you lose sight of what you have. And instead of being happy, you become sad. Here he's now coveting. Coveting his brother's party. Coveting his brother's arrival. Forgetting and should you should be celebrating about the fact that his brother arrived. And he doesn't know how to celebrate. He says, I don't even know how to celebrate. I, I, I've never celebrated my friends. I don't know how it is to be glad for someone else. Which is ultimately the antidote for covetousness. And folks, if you think that's not in your heart, trust me when I tell you it is because it's in mine. And that's why we need God, desperately. Comparing. I remember reading a book by Nick Vujicic, who apparently is in town right now, or is he coming to town? And I remember re reading the book because Nick was a legless, armless individual who really won the battle over depression. He never had a problem with complaining because his parents made sure he wouldn't complain. Never had a problem with existing. But his book was powerful because it, it talked about one particular instance where he went to a church in L.A. He was about to speak. And right there, there was another baby that was being passed around and he sees them. I remember my one-on-one -on -one conversation with Nick. I sat with him and we talked and what was that like? And he began to explain it's not the complaining that was an issue for him. It was the comparing. When he started seeing what other people could do and what he couldn't do. It wasn't even the fact that he couldn't scratch an itch of a mosquito. It wasn't, it wasn't any of that. The issue was when it came down to this whole idea of comparing. And then that rust that cancer, that thing in our heart that God doesn't want there begins to play at us. And I remember he was describing to me that moment in L.A. when he sought the Lord and prayed and the Holy Spirit, whom we prayed about earlier today, flooded his heart and said, I've allowed this for you so that you can be a blessing to this same child. Changed him forever. And now people compare to him I was talking to him. He was telling me, you know, Pastor, I, you pray for me. I said, what do you want me to pray for? He says, I travel 200 times a year because I speak worldwide now. But he had to deal with that comparing attitude. The faith to believe that God can take care of me. I don't have to compare myself with you just because I don't have legs and arms. Because God can bless me. I remember the day Nick got married. And now as a child. And how covetousness and comparing could have destroyed him. And you. And me. And how many times it's already destroyed many people. Who are already blessed. But they keep complaining and they keep comparing. And it scuttles you. That word scuttle is basically a little hole in your boat that causes you to sink. It's called covetousness. When you should be taking care of business with God and saying, God, thank you. I'm just grateful that I'm where I am. Now further in verse 30, but when this son of yours, notice, he says, but when this son of yours, he's now not just comparing, he's now accusing the father. He can't even have the, 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 the desire to call his brother, brother. And he can't even address his father, father. Now, now the, the relationship has broken off. That's what covetousness does. That's what comparing and complaining does. You All of a sudden now, you, you don't even want to have a relationship with your father. You don't even want to have a relationship with your brother. Because now it's about competition. These are the lines, folks. 
Why do you do what you do? By the way, this can happen to ministers. I've got a bigger church. I preach better than you. I've got better revelation than you. We've got a better worship leader. This can happen to anybody. And the lines are clear. Complaining. Comparing. Competing. Competing with what? Competing with who? Who's devoured your property. Now he's, he goes for the juggler. He, he goes for the throat. He says, now listen. Now, now he says, no, no, you know what? It's really not just that. It's this son of yours. And I'll tell you what he did. He devoured all your property and with prostitutes. And you dare to kill the fattened calf and give it to him and don't even share anything with me? That's covetousness right there. This combination of complaining and comparing and competing is the gunk of our souls that God does not want there. It'll kill you. I know. Been there, done that. He wants to cleanse you of that. He doesn't want you competing. Last Friday, I had lunch with a good friend. His name is Bo Sanchez. And Bo and I meet very often. He's Catholic, and spend a lot of time with Bo because we compare notes. I teach him about leadership skills, management skills based on Scripture. And he's one of the most prolific Filipino writers I know. He's written 45 books, and I've written four. If you're smart, you want to be his friend. Amen? And we sit down together, and I say, and Bo, tell me, how, how do you write? So give me your secrets. Not in competition. Never was, never will be. I'm not trying to win. I'm trying to build the kingdom. I'm trying to make one person known throughout the world. We live in a world that's so inundated with complaints, entitlement. You owe me this. Comparing. Verse 30, but when this son of yours came, who's devoured your property, you, you, you just did it. Now I can't even say anything about his father, good about his father or brother. But watch what the father says. He said to him, son, I don't think you quite understand this. And that's the point. Son, it's not a relationship here. And you're throwing this relationship away. Because of your enviousness, because of your covetousness, because of your selfishness, because of this issue in your soul, because of all your comparing, because of all your coveting, because of all this competitiveness in you. By the way, competi competitiveness is not bad. Confidence is not bad. Competitiveness is good. How many of you know if we're going to have a basketball team, we better have a competitive basketball team? It's when you're competing with your neighbor, your brother, your wife, your office mate, who's part of your team, by the way. It's when you're wanting what is his and not enjoying what's yours that God's against. You're always with me. Son, I love you. You're always with me. All I, that's mine is yours. I love you. I love you. Do you get it? If that's not enough for you to be content, there's nothing else on this earth that will make you content. I love you. Verse 32, it was fitting. It was right for us to celebrate, have a party. By the way, this is the antidote. If you read the prodigal son, the story of the prodigal son, the recurring theme four times in that story is the word celebrate. If you want to overcome covetousness, celebrate. Celebrate what? Celebrate God's love. Your brother was dead and he's alive again. The more you celebrate God's love for you, the less covetous you're going to be. And the less you celebrate God's love for you, the more covetous you're going to be. And you've got to celebrate. Many of you know that I have three sons. And now they're fathers. Two of them are fathers, and one of them is soon to be a father. 
God is the greatest father of all time. And by that, I mean this. The same way that I raised my three sons, I don't treat all my sons the same way. When it came to spanking my children when they were young, I couldn't spank the youngest so much because she looked so, he looked so much like his mother. <laughs> I couldn't spank my oldest son too much because he looked so, he was, he actually didn't look, he was the only angel. I don't even know what planet he came from. I kept spanking my second son because he kept reminding me of me. <laughs> and I knew he needed it. I never treated these guys the same way because I love them and because I am their father, I know who they are. I know what will work for them and their job is not to be jealous or covetous of each other but to love me back. Remember one Christmas... We are slightly older already. I gave Joseph the book on Coca-Cola, which I normally give to my second son, who's a businessman. The history, a very well thought through, analytical, based on good journalistic research on the history of Coke. And I wanted to teach him about not just ministry skills, but management skills. And I bought my son, David, King's Cross by Tim Keller, and I gave it to him. And, and typically at Christmas time, we give each other books, and, and for the first time, the books were reversed. And when they opened these books, my second son went to Joseph and said, I think that book is mine. <laughs> and I said, no. For this season of your life, you need Tim Keller's King's Cross. And for this season of your life, you need Coca-Cola. Fathers know their sons. And if fathers know their sons, the God in heaven knows you inside and out. Psalm 139 says you're still thinking about it. You're just positioning yourself. He already knows what you're going to do. When you don't know that and you don't trust him, you become covetous. When you know he loves you, he loves me. And he knows me so well. What he gives you, he won't give me. He'll give me something that will fit me at the right moment, at the right time, at the right season. Just the right amount that will not destroy me. If you gave me 50 million pesos, I might blow myself up. If you give some of you 50 million pesos, you're going to look at that and give it away because you're generous. He loves you. Celebrate God's love. That's how you kill this. The prodigal son, the entirety of that story is this idea of celebration. At the front end of the story, when the son came home, he said, the son came to him, Father, I've, I've sinned against heaven and before you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to him, Sir, bring quickly the best robe and put it on him and put a ring on his hand and his shoes on his feet. We're having a party. Bring the fat and calf. Don't, go get, don't get one of those scrawny little things over there. Get me the fattest one and kill it. We're having a party today. We're celebrating. Don't just celebrate God's love. Celebrate God's love for your neighbor. As I traveled with my gigantic entourage of in-laws, I finally landed in the right bus with all the young people. Several moments to be envious and thought, I wish my family was like this. These guys are so close to each other. I looked at my wife and his, her, her cousins and how they have, these guys had ID tags. They traveled from all over the world to come together. They had Hawaiian uniforms, and they had, they had color combinations, the yellow family, the green family, the red family. And all the in-laws were required to wear this. Like a good soldier, I wore mine. Here's the point. Multiple moments for envy, covetousness. And every time I did, I just say, God, thank you that you've even allowed me to see this. Thank you that I can even celebrate what these people have. On the bus home, at about 2.30 in the morning, the Lord woke me up 
and I found my wife with her, with her mouth opened in the bus asleep. And I took her. And as I put her on my chest, I saw a smile on her face. And I was so happy because I was celebrating her joy. I was just so happy that she was happy. And I looked around the bus and I saw all those guys exhausted. They were celebrating. And I was celebrating with them. Thank God for their family. Thank God for the blessing. Thank God for generations that live that way. Enjoy your neighbor. Don't envy him. Celebrate what he has. As I close, verse 24, for this son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and now is found, and they began to celebrate. Don't just celebrate your neighbor's, God's love for your neighbor. Celebrate his success. Celebrate his wins. Be the guy that announces it. Wow, listen to this guy. This guy just did the greatest thing in the world. Covetousness will die. I promise you. Covetousness will disappear. Right on this stage, my friend Ferdi Kabiling was bishopized. <laughs> Became the official running bishop of the Philippines. Ran from further than Ilocos, all the way down to Holo, I think. Where? Baliktad pala. No, from bottom up, from Serangani to the top. At the age of 50. Ridiculous. He ran 50 kilometers every day for 50 days at the age of 50. He's a monster. I don't want to covet that. I'm going to die if I did that. But he was standing here, and I had to introduce the meeting. Celebrate it. I celebrate the young pastors of our movement that are going to outrun me. I'm old. I feel old. But I celebrate them. I celebrate the fact that they're new, but they're starting out, but they're going to be great. I celebrate Michael. I celebrate the guy with the little ukulele there. I mean, I... I celebrate him. He's Indonesian. I, I didn't even know he was Indonesian. But celebrate. A friend of mine from Australia I follow on Instagram, Tim. Tim McDonald is a pastor in Brisbane. He's a good friend of mine, a great preacher. Everything that you can covet about, you can covet about this guy. On the side, this guy has a boat. And he's Australia's number one deep sea fishing champion. In other words, he goes down, fishes without a tank, without breathing. And this is what he posts on Instagram. <laughs> right. So every time I follow him, I say, okay, I'm going to follow Tim. Okay, well, Tim, how are you doing? And I'm going to follow. And this is, this is his post. Every time I open my Instagram, this is what I'm looking at. And every time I see this, I get, I, I, my wife says, why are you laughing again? I'm looking at the fish that Tim took. I'm celebrating it. I thank God he lives where he lives and not in the concrete jungle that I am, but I don't envy him. I thank God he's my friend. I thank God in the next time I go to Brisbane, he's going to be out there and he's going to try to get me in this boat that gets me dizzy. But I can celebrate. And I saw this. This got me envious. <laughs> I mean, how does anybody wrestle with one of those underneath the water without a tank? And then I saw this. Now his son is doing it with him. <laughs> Celebrate. It'll kill covetousness. It'll cause you to enjoy. Let me close. Complaining... Celebrate God's love for you, and you turn that into celebration. Comparing, celebrate God's love for your neighbor, and that will turn into compassion. The truth of the matter is, no matter how nice someone else's car is, he's got issues, and so do you. And that's what God's trying to address. He's trying to fix this world 
and he's doing it one person at a time. It begins with you and me. That's why rules don't work. That's why religion will fail you. Because it's a line that's rigid. It's a line that says you shouldn't even step on the line. No, 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 no. What the, how this works is you will step on the line. Because you're not God. And because without God, you are at best stupid. Okay? If you haven't realized that now, realize it right now. Without God, you're Adam and Eve. You are just simply stupid. It's after you step on that line, what do you do? And thirdly, competing. Celebrate your neighbor's success, and that becomes cooperation. It's magical. As I close, I bring you back the greatest rule breaker of all, Jesus. Do not think I've come to abolish the law or the prophets. I've come to abolish them. I've come to fulfill them. Whereas the Ten Commandments says, you shall not have other gods before me, in Jesus, you shall not have any gods before me. Whereas it says, you shall not carve an image or an idol or anything of that in, made of, in heaven and earth, in Jesus, you will not make an idol. Where it says all the things that the Bible says, you should not kill, you should not murder, you should not lie, that's only possible in Christ. If you want to stop coveting, go back to Christ. Go to Jesus and end it there. And covetous will end. Amen? Do you stand on your feet as we close in the word of prayer? Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Just close your eyes, bow your heads, allow the Holy Spirit to speak to you. There's some of you here today, the Lord is putting a new conviction. Look up here for a minute. Conviction. The Holy Spirit convicts you, shows you that area of your life, whether that's complaining, whether that's comparing, whether that's competing, He'll show you. Now when you say, God, I repent. I, I, I don't want it anymore. I break out of agreement with it. In other words, I'm, I'm throwing it away. Rather, give me a new conviction to love you, to serve you, to obey your word. And gradually, one day at a time, every time you step on that poop of a line, back off. You move and back off. Convict me, Lord. Back off. Convict me, Lord. Convict me, Lord. Until your convictions become, don't need to go there. I'm well and fine right here. In the presence of my God, with the joy of the Lord, with the contentment of God. Amen? Close your eyes and if you're saying, God, deliver me. Deliver me from complaining, from comparing, from competing. If that's your heart, would you just lift up your hands towards heaven this morning? God, I'm just repenting before you. I don't want to be covetous. Help me, Holy Spirit of God. Help me, God. I don't want to covet. I don't want to live with this cancer in my soul. I want your peace that surpasses all understanding to guard my heart and my mind in Christ Jesus, my Lord. Show me the lines each and every time I step on them and give me convictions to back away. I pray this in the power of the name of Jesus Christ, my Lord. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.